Um, I thank everybody for your patience and your time today. This is a very important law. Um, this was once described to me as a zero-sum game. You make your companies no money, you cost your companies a lot of money. But in the long run, as long as your company doesn't end up on the front page of the Straits Times, um, the New York Times, or any of the other times out there as having done something wrong, I think you've done your job. So our next presentation is going to be on strategic goods technology violations revealed by um, Katsuharu Igari, the director from uh, METI, that we heard earlier in the panel. So, sir, if you go ahead and, and we'll go with that. And then after that, we're going to hear about some case studies from the U.S. side. And then we're going to hear a presentation on catch-alls. So, Igari-san, thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. Sorry to that, uh, show my face again here, and then <laughs> I'm a little hesitant to say, uh, you know, that, uh, to talk to you over and over. But uh, <clears throat> this is a uh, uh, very that in interesting that there uh, are issues that are uh, uh, maybe that it might be inter interesting for you that to explain some Japanese that the experience of some violation or some enforcement cases. So Uh, in Japan, we, uh, with regard to some enforcement cases, uh, that uh, we, that the METI is a licensing authority, but we also conducting some post-shipment enforcement. And we also closely work with uh, the Japanese customs and the Japanese police authority to uh, detect and to capture and to uh, uh, some, the, uh, some of the some illegal exports. So we, very, uh, cl uh, cl uh, we are these uh, three organizations closely working together and then, <coughs> for example, that when the customs, uh, when they found some certain export without uh, obtaining license, they will that, uh, call us and they and they say that uh, is it okay to some uh, uh, declare this that uh, some authorized this that the export declaration and then and we check that there are some the uh, uh, items and the exporters and then and there's some induced this uh, destination and we say okay or was an we say that the SM uh, uh, stop it and also and the make export that come to our office. Um. And also with regard to some police authorities, uh, uh, we are that day to day are some, uh, some because that the uh, 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 security export control system or some strategic trade control system is not easy for that the police authority or for that the custom authority to understand. So that's why that we that the, uh, the uh, gives uh, them some like, information and the advice with what kind of item is that controlled, and uh, what is that specification of this item? So, what this goods or technology, and then uh, that, uh, and then and the talk was some give some advice to some police authority, and then it is scope of some that uh, or some export control list or uh, it, uh, this item is subject to export control, and then and then some exporter should uh, uh, ob obtain that uh, export license. So we uh, every day we are uh, uh, talking with our some that their counterparts in in, uh, in uh, Japanese authorities. And also, <coughs> important thing is some international uh, uh, cooperation with some um, foreign partners. Uh, we we receive the information from that the foreign partners and then detect certain some that uh, export of some non-listed items so like uh, for example no North Korea, and then or that uh, when we have uh, some the uh, some the information of the violation law by the Japanese exporters, so we sometimes contact we contacted with our Asian uh, counterparts. Like, uh, such as Hong Kong or some that uh, uh, Taiwan, Taiwan also uh, or some other some the uh, uh, some the licensing that the people, and they make them to stop certain export or some that uh, to collect uh, make asks uh, its uh, international partners to collect the information. So we uh, day to day some exchange such kind of information now so that uh, con uh, we are strengthening such kind of some co uh, cooperation with uh, that the domestic authorities and also international partners. So these, without having such kind of some cooperation with the, the international the, the partners, uh, it is getting more and more difficult to detect or some capture some such kind of illegal some exports or some uh, violation of law by the Japanese exporters or foreign that uh, some traders. <coughs> this is uh, this is uh, uh, that uh, just. Uh, 
uh, our some of the uh, procedure of some postership, some postership met verification by METI. So after that, all that the procedure was done for that approval or some licensing or some that the customs declaration, and then after it is exported, and then we that uh, we uh, depend on the some that information we received from that the customs or some that the foreign partners or some sometimes a voluntary disclosure by that the Japanese exporters. We started that the post -ship, post shipment verification. <coughs> And the, there are some uh, the information will be provided uh, from the domestic uh, domestic some sources or some foreign sources, and then the, the we afterwards we will started some talking with some our exporters and then ask them to some uh, uh, provide some information of their export, and whether it is that the controlled items or some that the, whether it's a, wh which destination we you are uh, the. Uh, Planning to export or some any that uh, you know that the uh, uh, any that uh, is some that uh, any that matters for that the violations are we are uh, checked through such kind of our some uh, collecting information procedures, <coughs> and then we also conducted some on-site inspection and then make uh, make our exporters to provide there are some all that they export documents or some contract or some customs declaration uh, that there are some documents. Uh, we request all of these that there are some like a final uh, like a payment some uh, some activities or some that uh, we request all of these information through our some uh, the uh, some the uh, inspection and also that there are some requesting some reports and this. and uh, uh, collecting such kind of information we that assess the some how that uh, this that uh, our violation is that uh, is that the big or some it is that uh, is okay or sometimes. Uh, some exporter misunderst misunderstood or misunderstand that there's some the uh, cut uh, some crash classification of items. So sometimes it, it is no problem for that uh, such kind of export. But uh, if it is uh, that uh, some very serious problem, so we will start that uh, we also that uh, uh, if it is so serious, we will also uh, talk with some our police people or some uh, for that uh, some that uh, uh, criminal some uh, procedures, some old court procedures. <coughs> Uh, so we also collecting new information through our audit, through our some, uh, uh, this is an inspection for the some ICP holders. Through our inspection to some ICP holders, we can, we also that collect certain, you know, information or if that the exporter doesn't provide some that document of some it, each and the contract or some transaction of certain exports or certain items, if that the exporter, uh, 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 hesitate to or some reluctant to show some of some evidence, we will that ask them again and again. And, uh, and under our foreign exchange and foreign trade act, we can order uh, that the each, each that uh, each that the exporters to some provide uh, that uh, information or some report to us. And if they do not some that they are comply with our some order, then we may that there's some we, or we can finally that uh, we will we can finally punish them or some penalize them or some we can also that uh, some. Uh, uh, some uh, pr proceed with some criminal that uh, uh, some court or some pro uh, criminal uh, case procedures, <coughs> and then if and depend on uh, some that the seriousness of some uh, the violation, uh, we uh, we will that uh, some that uh, guide them or some to some the collect their that activities or some we can advise we will advise them or some we may add some that administrative section for that uh, if it is that the uh, violation is so serious. For example, if the, uh, this uh, item is exported to that uh, some countries of concern or some entities of concern, and uh, we may that uh, uh, the company will be some the, um, the uh, uh, charged some administrative sanctions. Uh, <coughs> yeah. I, I will show you some that uh, the, uh, uh, each enforcement cases in other that uh, some and other some that uh, the uh, my presentation the the la latter half of my presentation. <coughs> uh, these are <coughs> these are some recent uh, serious cases of violation. All these cases were that uh, together with some criminal charge of some uh, that the penalty and also that. The <coughs> uh, that this recent cases that uh, some that the uh, violation of uh, the some foreign students and then using some internet auction and then other cases 
some did the violation of some the certain items to Iran or some North Korea, or that also happened in a couple of years ago. <coughs> and then <coughs> going back to the pages, there are certain types of uh, 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 some violation or some illegal exports. So of course there are two types. One type is some intentional, that's a the bad attitude by some exporters. So they are some using some like, uh, like uh, they are some delivering that item by hand carry luggage or some using international courier services because usually in, uh, international courier services not so much that uh, well that uh, uh, some that aware of uh, that the export control system. So, uh, and but in case of if that exporter uh, some use that some customs uh, procedures, custom made that the uh, custom will easily that find uh, the some the violation of law or some like uh, illegal export. But some internal international courier services, it's not easy to that uh, detect certain some illegal uh, export. So that's why sometimes illegal exporters use these that uh, some method. And the other case is like a disguise in some, like uh, this is not controlled and the specification is low and uh, this is not, uh, this is not some that there uh, are some that high performance items. This is uh, uh, like uh, some very cheap items. This is sold in Akihabara or some uh, free market. So this is uh, some excuse, but uh, these also disguise in some uh, as non-controlled -contro items also that are uh, uh, sometimes used. And also that the false destination, that sometimes that they, uh, that violator use that uh, like uh, uh, some member country of export control regime as some like a transit some point and then and then de exported these items to some other countries of concern. These kind of forced destination is also that uh, happens sometimes. <coughs> and these are uh, these are the some type of some unintentional illegal exports. So. Uh, uh, exporter doesn't have uh, some that uh, some intention to some uh, uh, the uh, to uh, to conduct illegal export, but uh, <coughs> many cases like uh, some you know exporters like SME doesn't have uh, some the uh, knowledge of some uh, our export control uh, our our regulation and also uh, sometimes <coughs> they uh, they think that a sample of us or some that the test products is not subject to export control. Of course, there are, that there are some room for the application of some limited value or some license exemption, but sometimes some items or some destination, this kind of exp uh, exemption will not be applied. So that uh, sometimes that there are some exporters misunderstand that such kind of some the, uh, uh, some that the license exemption or some that they consider that the used machine or sample is not subject to some control. And also, <coughs> Uh, sometimes that the uh, some exporters that misunderstand some update or some that the new export control list also without following some new export control, control list uh, that the company also fail to some the or uh, some uh, sh uh, company also that uh, uh, violate uh, some export control regulations <coughs> and also the uh, uh, difficult thing is uh, that uh, this uh, the second part uh, second part of some second paragraph some exporter does not check the classification of goods which are done by some producers. So as my, that, uh, colleague from, as my that Japanese that, uh, colleagues uh, mentioned uh, previously, that uh, uh, sometimes that the uh, original that the producer of that there are some certain items may that uh, misunderstand or some uh, mis, uh, mis may made a mistake for classification of some controlled item or not. But uh, we encourage, uh, uh, with the METI also encouraging some each exporter to double check that the, some the uh, classification made by some producers or some makers or some other that the partners. And so, and then by, uh, con uh, by conducting such kind of some double check, they can avoid any some kind of violations. So that's that the, uh, uh, a very uh, some difficult but important some uh, point. <coughs> and then also, <coughs> Sometimes that the, uh, uh, that some SME also, or sometimes some, uh, our academia people also misunderstand some. That uh, like uh, some machine itself is subject to some control. That is actually that easy to understand because custom also check that uh, whether this is controlled or not. But also in case of some uh, software or some prog program or some technology, uh, uh, it's, it's not easy to understand whether it is controlled. So. And also sometimes a specification of technology is a little bit different pro, uh, from that the goods controls. So because of that, some, sometimes some, you know, 
some company misunderstand some how to deal with some software, some programs, some technology. That's also happening now, some violation or some, uh, uh, some illegal export cases. <coughs> and then <coughs> finally, that the, uh, uh, <coughs> the, the, the last point is actually, this is very, you know, that the, uh, this is like uh, some, this is very some, you know, the uh, easy things, but sometimes that the, uh, some export control did uh, some team in a certain company and also there are some team of some the uh, storage team or some sales team or some transportation team are a little bit different. And also that the <coughs> some that the number or some product, like uh, some product number of certain item is a little bit different. Like P0, like uh, 107 or P0, 106, or depending on the difference of such kind of some production number, that sometimes that the classification is also different. But I, you know, sometimes that there's some it in inside some certain some company, but also there are some mis uh, miscommunication between some sales team and also export control team and also storage team. So, and then this kind of some that uh, you know, and then the mistake made by is made by some through that shipment procedures. So, these are also that uh, some typical some case of some violation. We are also that are uh, encouraging our industry in Japan then and, and try to some. Uh, try to some de reconsider and try to some uh, focus such kind of mistakes made by in a, in a previous cases. So. <coughs> and then coming back to the our some uh, our some recent some enforcement cases, <coughs> uh, <coughs> I will that explain that the detail in the next pages. So we, if we it is that the very serious that the violation, of course it go to some criminal charge or for that's a penalty and also and. The, and then, but also that uh, maybe also that they are charged some administrative sanction for that uh, uh, sometimes that uh, uh, some provision, prohibition of export uh, maximum is like three years or something. So if it is, a, if it is a pre uh, pre uh, like the uh, prohibition of export for that uh, three years, usually it's, it has very big impact for that some trading companies or some, some that, uh, uh, that uh, exporting companies. <coughs> And, but uh, it is uh, some very serious cases, and otherwise that uh, some warning and the publish like publish warning is also other sources by naming certain that uh, you know that the names of violator in our some uh, many home pages, and then that uh, there are some you know their trade partner may ask a question on the, is it okay to uh, deal with that uh, your company or some in the bank may consider uh, this company is has some uh, compliance program or not so. So by giving such kind of pressure, uh, we can uh, we can achieve such kind of pressure by taking this at a wo uh, publish warning procedures. Another one is a submission of some explanation or sub submission of report, and by <coughs> uh, by some conducting such kind of the uh, some the uh, uh, the uh, uh, administrative guidance, uh, we are pushing that uh, each that exporter to not to 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 not repeat their mistakes again. So. And these are some of the cases of some enforcement, uh, some uh, <coughs> the uh, violation in Japan. <coughs> these are the uh, uh, some foreign uh, international student in Japan. The he uh, <coughs> he or she that uh, exported uh, some thermographic cameras, but he uh, bought this item through that uh, internet auction in Japan, and he also that exported this item through third countries. So. This is the point is the involvement of individual. It's very difficult to some, you know, uh, some outreach such kind of individual. And it is but an international student. So we are also that uh, are conducting some intensive outreach to some academia or some university people to not make you students to be involved in such kind of some illegal exports. And also <coughs> this is uh, using some that auction site and also using international courier, style, courier services. So this method is to try to avoid some that uh, uh, some that the procedure for that uh, some uh, like a customs declaration or some to avoid any that uh, some you know the uh, uh, to use certain loophole. So so what we are doing we are in, uh, outreaching in some international uh, auction site or some international courier site service courier service company to not be involved with such kind of some illegal export. But uh, these are also uh, increasing challenge for us. Uh, <coughs> and this is the second uh, case is, is uh, illegal export of some uh, carbon fiber to some you know, uh, certain countries. Uh, this is actually that the, uh, 
uh, the product was that the resale in Japan from manufacturer to some domestic company to some other company. And then this that the company A <coughs> declared a METI that uh, this item would be exported to some uh, it's to that uh, some uh, some uh, non uh, uh, to that the uh, the country X. The country X is actually that the no usually no problem of some uh, 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 as a destination, but uh, this uh, there are some that there are some uh, some uh, um, like some in, in the intentional some that the re-export is also that the planted from the beginning. So this is the circumvention of some export and then. This company is actually that uh, uh, is, is try to uh, is actually declare some that the long that the destination to some that the authority. That's why that the we that they are punished uh, the, uh, the, the criminal charge was added and also that the media also that they conducted some administrative sanctions. So <coughs> and other cases, <coughs> this is an export. Actually, this is an export of, of uh, to <coughs> uh, some exca excavator to some North Korea. And then uh, METI, this is actually also catch all cases. This happened some 10 years ago or some, at, at, at the time we did, uh, Japanese government didn't some, uh, some, uh, some uh, conduct some that the trade ban to North Korea. So, so but uh, this is uh, some uh, export of some ex excavator to North Korea. So, and, and we consider this excavator will be used, the excavator will be used for that some North Korea's uh, like missile activities, so that's why that uh, we inform this company A to not uh, to that uh, apply for license if you wanted to export. That means that uh, we will uh, 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 we are not intending to some uh, authorize export of this that uh, excavator to some North Korea. But uh, <coughs> this company A try to avoid such kind of some the uh, the uh, uh, they they want to some avoid some like the loop uh, some that. Uh, uh, our some regulation, so that's why they uh, uh, disregard our some inform, and also they camouflage. This is an uh, export to some domestic company, but uh, this that other company is also that uh, intending to export this that uh, uh, excavator through third country. So <laughs> this is some camouflaging and also circumvention and uh, of some the, this that the item, and then this is this is also that the case of a violation of a Japanese catch-all control, and then. <coughs> So we are, uh, this is a reality we are also facing that uh, even though we, together with the custom and then some police uh, authority is try to some avoid such kind of cases, but uh, we sometimes fail to some stop them to some export. But uh, we are, in, in order to some uh, avoid such kind of some, uh, the, uh, uh, some illegal export or some violations, so we are now uh, the, the conducting some total ban of export and import to some North Korea. So we are strengthening our some that enforcement activities towards North Korea so particularly. <coughs> <coughs> and then <coughs> this is a case of some masking that uh, uh, sometimes uh, th this is also, this case is also happened like around 10 years ago, but uh, this and machine tools that uh, some related company uh, the, um, uh, a, uh, actually that uh, they declare this that the specification of this item or technology is very low. So that's why it's not subject to export control. And then they illegally exported some uh, some technology of some that the measurement data of some machine tools, and then and uh, they conducted this that the illegal that the export for uh, many times. That's why that some <coughs> uh, we also that uh, that the conduct charged the administrative sanction, and also criminal charges of like uh, five thousand uh, 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 fifty million yen was charged to that the, this company. This is a uh, like a significant and a very serious that uh, violation of Japanese uh, law and regulations. So, <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, so in order to avoid such kind of some the uh, uh, the uh, miss that the declaration by some that uh, uh, some that the trader or some manufacturer. So we are strengthening our that there are some that uh, some the discussion with the machine tool uh, producers and uh, some that the machine, uh, like uh, some trader for the machine tools, and uh, make them to, to prepare their some, that the, uh, like uh, uh, some sheet of classification of each that the products or some technology or program. So, so and then we, sh and then by sharing such kind of some data information with custom, so we try to avoid similar uh, violation cases. <coughs> <coughs> So uh, I, I explained this in the morning. So 
uh, having such kind of, uh, we also try to some strengthening our some that uh, uh, some enforcement activities together with our some domestic or international some that authority for that enforcement issues. But uh, we are also facing that uh, such kind of violation cases every year. That's why we are uh, uh, strengthening our some that uh, uh, penalty and also like some enforcement and also that the period of some the uh, some administrative sanction. So try to stop such kind of some uh, enforcement uh, or some violation cases. <coughs> and uh, this is also I also explained this in the morning, so I'm not repeat. But uh, I try to some. Uh, 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 give some warning to uh, any that in, uh, any that exporters or some any person who is that uh, are planning some violation of law or some illegal exports. We uh, we want to make them to some give up such kind of uh, their intention. That's why we strengthening and we try to some uh, some uh, close some any loophole and so. <coughs> ah, and also that uh, with regard to some criminal process that. Uh, our METI is also the closely working with some that the police and also uh, some court uh, procedures. Our people is also attending that uh, this at the court uh, some that uh, uh, cases and then and explain and state that the uh, that uh, how that uh, this uh, what is the background of some export control system and how why that this uh, technology or some goods is controlled and whether this that the uh, specific export is subject to control or not. So we are. <coughs> Uh, I try to cooperate and also we are giving such kind of some you know, support to some uh, uh, court procedure. So uh, collecting and also that uh, collaborating with such kind of that uh, some respective some that authority, we, we are uh, uh, strengthening and we are further that uh, some the, uh, uh, yeah, we, we try to avoid any that uh, some intention of some uh, violation of uh, uh, any court uh, procedures. Our people is also attending that uh, this at the court uh, some that uh, uh, cases and then and explain and state that the uh, that uh, how that uh, this uh, what is the background of some export control system and how why that this uh, technology or some goods is controlled and whether this that the uh, specific export is subject to control or not. So we are <coughs> uh, I try to cooperate and also we are giving such kind of some you know, support to some uh, uh, court procedure. So. Uh, collecting and also that uh, collaborating with such kind of that uh, uh, some respective some that authority, we we are uh, uh, strengthening and we are further that uh, some the uh, uh, yeah we we try to avoid any that uh, uh, some intention of some uh, violation of uh, uh, any that uh, violation of some our regulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, thank you, sir. Next presentation is on counterproliferation case studies out of the United States by Don Pierce, senior special agent from the Office of Export Enforcement, also previously the Export Control Officer here in Singapore. Yes. Don, have fun. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I, I like to say I had the best job in the Bureau of Industry and Security, which was the Export Control Officer in Singapore. Now I have the second best job which is the senior special agent for uh, liaison and interdiction, which, uh, as I tried to explain to my son, means I go around and I talk to people about how they should do their jobs better, but I don't have to actually do the job anymore, and I still get paid more. <laughs> and he said, that's not fair, Papa. So I used this as a learning moment, said, son, life's not fair. Get used to that. <laughs> so it's wonderful to be back. And uh, today, we've kind of reached back into the archives to uh, talk about one of the cases that's in our uh, publication, uh, Don't Let This Happen to You. Uh, if you don't have a hard copy, we haven't reprinted it in a while, so I don't, I don't know if the hard copies are still floating around out here, but um, it is available at the BIS website, um, bis.doc.gov, and uh, it's great bedtime reading if you're an insomniac. Um, but it does have some exciting cases that uh, you can kind of take a look at and uh, as compliance professionals here, see where people went wrong and how maybe you would have handled the situation differently. So we'll jump into it. So um, do these names seem familiar from any pending transactions? 
that you might have going to, to Pakistan? If, if, if so, see me after the, after the meeting. We, we give great weight mitigation to voluntary self-disclosure. <laughs> so back in 1995, uh, a U.S. company made a licensed export of uh, uh, devices to a commercial nuclear power plant project in, uh, in China. And then uh, years later, they received four uh, inquiries that uh, looked very similar, except um, in one of the documents uh, they mentioned, would there any, be any problem with it going to the Chasma nuclear power plant in Pakistan? So, yeah, there we go, red flag, right? Um, the, uh, the, they, somebody was awake. Somebody said, hey, you know what, let's call back and let's ask some questions, and you know, they got a, uh, uh, an end use statement showing that it was going to this thermal power station. So, um, big company in the United States, Computer Communications USA, here's their global headquarters. Uh, and, their, and their logistics uh, department, otherwise known as the UPS store. So, um, basically, this is one of those moments where if, uh, if you're a compliance professional and you have access to the internet, um, you might have been able to notice that Computer Communication USA doesn't exactly look like the um, large-scale company that they purported to be. So, I'm going to kind of skip through this to get to, because uh, we all know what companies do, um, although you notice that he was only making like 7.5% 7, 7 cost on top of this. So, he's a proliferator, but not, I guess he's doing it for the love of the game. So, and I'm going to flip through this as well because I really want to get to this part. So, these, this is how his playbook looked. He tried to use third-party uh, uh, cutouts in uh, various countries. Now, um, use of the false end-user statement. Um, I'm sure everyone here has at one time or another gotten a document from a company and kind of scratched your head about it a little. I wanted to ask questions. And I'm pretty sure since you're sitting here, you probably picked up the phone or sent an email. Um, one of the things that, that we've realized in this and in many investigations is that sometimes people get shy. And they just want to, they just, they, you know, maybe they, it's because they want the deal. Maybe it's because it's 4.30 in the afternoon and uh, they're already thinking about the weekend. Um, you know, a hundred different reasons why human beings make decisions that probably aren't very good in the long run. And uh, again, voluntary self-disclosure if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards. Um, the problem with this is this guy was able to get away with it for, for quite a while because nobody was doing that homework. Nobody was scratching at these, uh, at, at, at the, and scratching the surface to see what was below. And uh, first rule of law enforcement, if they're doing one thing wrong, they're probably doing something else wrong too. We found that undervaluing in many cases is a, it's, it's, it's a red flag in and of itself. Um, most, most people in the, in, in the industry think it's a, it's, a, it's a minor issue. Some don't even realize that it can be a crime. You know, they maybe just want to, they want to beat the duty, they, they, they want to make the shipment look uh, less attractive to pilferage by lowering the value. They tell themselves a lot of lies to self-blind and pretend that what they're doing is something that's in the best interest of the company or, or the transaction. But re really, you know, undervaluing is undervaluing and it's a problem. <clears throat> Hiding the good stuff with everything else. Um, I started my career as a customs inspector at JFK Airport in New York, and uh, if I had a nickel for every time I had to dig through the, you know, two weeks of vacation clothes to get to the small wrapped package that the narcotics detector dog had hit on out on the, ba on the bag belt, I, you know, I'd, I'd be a rich man. Um, the, you know, trying to hide the, 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 what's valuable you know, in the middle of a, of, a, of a routine shipment 
You know, it's, 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 it's something that you might be able to notice in the paperwork, in the documentation. You know, the, the, you know, reviewing that paperwork, you, you might be able to notice, especially if they're mismarking or, or undervaluing. Let's talk about some of the devices that he was uh, working on. Um, so these personal dosimeters, I don't know, any, is there anyone here who was recently awakened from a coma um, and the last day they remember is like in the 1980s? Well, yeah, the thing looks kind of like the old school pager. Well, as you know, I, I won't read this whole thing to you, but he referred to these as digital calculators or digital pagers in the, in the, in the paperwork. Now, the values significantly lower than what a, a, a dosimeter should go for. You know, nuclear grade resins. Um, uh, uh, again, the total commercial cost ten thousand dollars, and he declares it at eight fifty. So, for my Singapore customs brethren in the room and sister, um, you know, this is one of those things where you know you remember that from 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 inspection one hundred one, is you know undervaluing is a problem. These coaxial attenuate. By the way, these slides are available, so I know I'm flipping through them. We're trying to keep this a little bit tighter than I had originally planned. Um, you know, fails to identify Suparco, the, the, which is uh, the Pakistani uh, space program, as the, uh, as, as the, as the end user. Um, and again, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you know, an entity of concern to us. Um, one of the things, and, and I, I actually meant to say this a little bit earlier, um, we talked a lot today about the U.S. designation of EAR-99. And uh, just to clarify, what, the way I try to explain this to, to people who are new to export controls is when you're doing any export transaction, the first step is to understand the commodity, of course. And having you know, ECCNs or product codes makes it a lot easier to understand the things that we really truly care about that are kind of in the middle to the top of the pyramid. But there are a lot of items that are at the bottom of that pyramid that don't require control to anything other than a bad end use or a bad end user. And that's what we designate as EAR-99. Everybody else in the world thinks of that as catch-all. I, like I like to use that EAR-99 um, designation because I think it reinforces to people that these items are somewhat controlled. They are, in the, case, in the parlance we use in America, they are subject to the Export Administration regulations. And while, generally speaking, they can go all over the world for, for most end uses and end users, we have a very narrow band of, of, of organizations and, and programs that we would require a license for these to go to. We also make that a little easier on the exporters by having things like the entity list, where we actually call out by name people who need to come in for licenses for all items subject to the EAR. It makes it, a, I think it makes it a little bit easier for, for, for those of you in compliance to be able to, to, to basically visualize the idea of catch-all. Okay. Again, so, some more EAR-99. <laughs> and the, the, you know, again, you know, the, the, the undervaluing on this and identifying the item as a spare part you know, back in my inspection days, again, um, you know, to harken back, um, the descriptions on paperwork are crucial. If you're filling something out and not specifying what is in the box, there's got to be a reason why you're doing that. Perhaps it's laziness. I mean, I know I've done a lot of end use checks where the paperwork looked real shady and we got there and had a great conversation with the company and it turns out just nobody ever asked them why they didn't you know break out the different items that they were sending and just called them all spare parts you know, I would always say spare parts for what a missile <laughs> and they, they, the eyes would go wide to get really nervous no no no, no I'm just kidding don't worry relax <laughs> if they'd seen me speak they would have gotten it was a joke at the first point but you know sometimes they don't come to these things um, the, 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 you know what, I'm going to skip to this one. So these are some of the things, you know, ripped from the, uh, from the case file 
that, uh, that were in some of his emails. Um, do not mention it's for Pakistan. And again, you know, that one is what we would have called a crime involving moral turpitude, something that you know is wrong and you do anyway. Next time, we'll break these quotes into different segments. In other words, separate it out, make smaller shipments, and hopefully keep it under, that, that, uh, under a low dollar value. Um, one of the reasons they would do that in the United States is we have a, we have a, a minimum dollar value for filing of shippers' export declarations. Um, items below 2,500 bucks, they don't have to fill out an SED unless there's a reason that we would need to know about the shipment, such as a license or a license exception. Difficulties were faced as the stores were for nuclear applications. So one of the things that, um, that these conferences are great for is, um, are, are there anyone in the nuclear supply chain in the room? Yeah, other than you, Kev? <laughs> See, if most likely none of us would be able to identify something for a nuclear application just on, on its face value. But, uh, but perhaps if you were to, you know, take a look at the item, you know, do kind of what we do before we do our end use checks and actually pull up what the thing does and, and, and how it works and what um, applications it might have, you might actually figure out that this little widget that you thought was a nothing burger because it's used in the semiconductor industry is also the thing that they use to trigger a nuclear weapon. True story. And a few other non-nuclear items. You know, it's kind of like, you know, take one from column A, take one from column B. Uh, and since these are restricted items and have nuclear application, that delivery date might cause a problem. So it's interesting, I think, in, in this particular case example, as to how, um, how much of a business plan this guy has for proliferation. You know, he's thought about this. This isn't, this isn't somebody who made a mistake. This is somebody who, who woke up in the morning and said, how can I support these illicit programs? Is there anyone in the audience who woke up and thought that this morning? Again, see me afterwards. Um, and I think that's, and, and one of the problems is that we always, we talk to each other a lot. You know, compliance and government folks. And, and we have this mindset where we just assume that most people are like us. They're generally good. They're trying to do a good job. They, they, they think that by doing this job, they sleep a little better at night because they're trying to make the world a safer place. And, 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 and the problem is, it's folks like this guy that prey on that. And what they hope is that you're not going to question them and that you're not going to pick up the phone and say, hey, you know what? Um, I'm wondering what you're planning on doing with these personal decimeters that you call pagers. Oh, and avoid disclosing the user in the best interest of the state. So um, anyone who doesn't want to tell you who they're doing business with. Now, I can think of a hundred reasons why in certain lines of, of, of work you might not want to tell another company who you're doing business with. If you're a middleman, if you're a, a, a distributor, you know, the people are afraid that if they don't have, you know, the, the control of the information of who they're doing business with, that uh, someone might be able to sneak in and underbid them. I kind of get that. Um, you have to be able to overcome that resistance, though. It might be, it's a lot easier for us in government to do this because, of course, you know, we can say, well, in that case, maybe we're not going to approve a license or we're going to. Um, you know, ask you to you know submit to you know submit this information anyway for an end use check. Um, and when you run into these situations, you have to make a decision. You know, is it is it a good business practice to trust this transaction? Roll the dice, and if it comes back, what am I going to say when some joker like me comes knocking at the door and asking about it? So we also talked a lot today about the fact that if we get to a criminal investigation, um, that means the system has failed. It means something has gone horribly wrong. And uh, in this case, 
you know, we were able to convince a, uh, a, a federal grand jury that, that there was you know, uh, significant violations to a level that we want to criminally prosecute. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that most likely there is no one in this room who, unless they're gonna come see me afterwards, um, has in their mind, went to, goes to work in the morning thinking or worrying about whether or not the, the, the Singapore Customs or the Bureau of Industry and Security is gonna come catch them this day. So, you don't wanna end up like this. And that's why you're here. And, and, and frankly, for us to, um, to, 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 to feel a little bit safer at night um, and to know that you know, people out here are asking questions and you know, digging beyond the, the obvious self-serving statements makes this a rare event. You know, the, the, the number of criminal cases that, that, that we do compared to the number of legitimate transactions that cross through the Bureau of Industry and Security in a, in a, in a week or a month or a year are minuscule. Um, but we are really depending on the system. And the system is really you, it's not us. You know, we, we, have, we have talented licensing officers who can look at the documents and, 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 and make a determination as to where a particular widget falls in the, in, in the control list and, and, and what, what licenses would be required or what exemptions are available. We have analysts who can connect the dots on transactions and, and, and conduct end use verification to make sure that the items are where they're supposed to be and doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, that's going to catch some bad actors every once in a while. But what really helps us is when somebody thinks back and goes, you know, this, this order, you know, it seems like that one from 1995, but there's just something odd about it. I think I'm going to call and ask. So. Our friend got a uh, uh, sentence to uh, 37 months in prison, which, uh, you know, that's, what, three years and a month away from your family, away from, from your life. And, uh, you know, it's because the, the, the judge who sentenced the, uh, the, the defendant felt it was a serious offense. And what makes this particular transaction more serious than than other export control violations or other administrative violations that might get handled with something ranging from a warning letter to a, to a monetary fine? Well, I think the fact that in, these, in this short presentation I was able to show you the, the mindset, I think that answers that question. And does this provide a level of deterrence? You know, this, uh, the, the, this story got a little bit in, of, of, uh, of, of publicity for us. Uh, it was in the New York Times. You know, it, it, it might have been in the Straits Times. I don't know. Probably not. Um, most likely, you guys will go home and Google it and you know, be able to read a little bit more about it than I was able to tell you in 15 minutes. But, um, but I think that what truly is the deterrent isn't the, f the threat of going to jail for three years. The deterrent begins when you start asking those questions. When you start requiring the people that you're doing business with to hold themselves to the same standard you do with regards to counterproliferation. You know, we call it strategic trade control for a reason. You know, we, it's, it's not just one company's ICP. It's the entire supply chain. And we're getting closer and closer to that day where, um, where these conferences are, it's going to be hard to find someone who hasn't been to at least one. 
and, and I'm, I'm hoping that by uh, being able to share these stories and being able to, to get together and talk about how we do business and how the, what the differences are in our, our particular situations, we'll be able to understand not just our little piece of that chain, but the entire chain. Questions? Come on, it's your one shot at talking to a genuine special agent. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Don. I'm gonna add a couple of things to that. Number one, um, in the compliance world, regulatory enforcement, however you wanna label it, we rely on you guys, we rely on your honesty. I mean, let's, let's be honest. We rely on you guys to be honest on your declarations, on your classifications of products, we rely on you guys to present all the appropriate and relevant information on those transactions. When you see cases like this, and we bring them out and we, we cover them in these settings because we want you to see what happens when you're not honest, when you're not doing what's supposed to be the right thing. Um, I, I said this a little bit ago that compliance is a zero-sum game for your companies. You are not making your companies any money. You're not selling a product. You're not creating new technology. You're not doing research and development. You're the one going to the sales department saying, stop, you can't do that. You're the one grabbing that shipping clerk as he's running the box out to the FedEx truck or the DHL truck. You're going, wait, wait, wait. We can't let that one go. And then senior management's going, but that's a huge contract that we could have a problem with. You know, sometimes you just gotta say no until you have that extra time to do your diligence. Because as Don said, I'll bet you if you look at the timing on these transactions, they weren't Monday at 10 o'clock in the morning. They weren't Wednesday at three o'clock in the afternoon. They were first thing Monday morning when you first come to work after a long weekend, or Friday afternoon when you can't wait to get out of, the, out of your office and get home to your families. These guys are masters at what they do. That's why we take the time and we have the Dons and the Igarisans and others come up and talk about these, this is what happens. We want you to just understand. Because I'm gonna tell you something, and, and in enforcement, your two best points of information are former employees and former spouses. So um, remember that, that you're, you may think you're getting away with something, but as soon as that employee leaves and realizes that they can dime you out because you, you did something to them, they're going to. Your competitors are gonna dime you out. And if you have competitors that are doing this, you can talk to Don or Madame Fazia or, or Irene sometime today. I'm sure they will listen. Um, okay, so we're moving on to our last presentation, but before we do that, go ahead and come on up, Esther. Um, how many people drove today and parked in the Tang parking lot? Raise your hand if you did. If you will stop by the reception desk on your way out, we have parking coupons for you for free so you do not have to pay. And don't be the, you know, the, the, the guy that forgets to take their cash card out of their, their reader and end up paying twice. Yeah, I've done that. And then forget to put it back in when you go through an ERP. Um, so now we run into our last presentation um, by Esther Ung from Singapore Customs about catch-all controls. So, Ms. Esther. Yeah, thank you, Scott. So congratulations, everyone, for staying to this stage. Uh, I'm the last presenter for the day. Uh, so my name is Esther from Singapore Customs and I'm representing on Singapore's relevant activity or what we know as catch-all controls. So before we delve into catch-all, I'd like to first show a general overview of the SGCA which was implemented since January 2003. Supporting the SGCA are three subsidiary legislations which set out the operational and technical details of the Act. So first up, the Strategic Goods Control Regulations provides the operational and detailed regulatory requirements. The fourth and fifth schedules to these regulations list the strategic goods for which a permit will be required if they are respectively transshipped and transit through Singapore regardless of their duration in the FTZ. The Strategic Goods Control Order lists the controlled strategic goods and technology and lastly, the Strategic Goods Control Brokering Order lists the items for which a registration of customs is required before brokering of these items can be carried out. Now, as SGCA's purpose is to curb the proliferation of WMD, 
It also incorporates a catch-all or relevant activity control on goods and technologies which are not specified in the control list but which the trader knows, suspects or has been notified by an authorised officer that they are intended or likely to be used wholly or in part for the development or production of any nuclear, biological or chemical weapon and their means of delivery. This ensures the continued relevance of our controls to evolving technologies and weapons development programs. So the SGCA includes catch-all control on goods which are intended to be used for WMD purposes and again it is known as relevant activities, so actually it's used interchangeably, it means the same thing. So here are some examples of dual-use items which can be used for WMD. There are steel pipes which can be cut to specifications for use in bomb production. There are connectors which connect pipes in a nuclear reactor for production of plut plutonium. There is ammonium chloride which is a precursor to making missile propellant. And there is also helium gas which can be used to dilute uranium hexafluoride gas for uranium enrichment. So why do we control goods and technology for relevant activity purposes? The reasons being, we need to keep pace with evolving technologies, lower spec items can be upgraded to perform at higher specifications, and even basic components can be used in WMDs. Singapore's relevant activity controls requires a permit to be declared if a company or person has been notified by customs, knows or has reasonable grounds to suspect that the goods will be used in connection with the relevant activity. Hence, if the technology or goods may be used for relevant activity, please submit a strategic good permit so that we can take a closer look at the transaction details. So again, permits are required for export, transshipment and transit, brokering and intangible transfer of technology for relevant activity. A permit is required for any electronic transmission of technology or brokering of goods or technology that are not listed in the SGCO or the SGC brokering order but are intended to be used for WMD. And prior to any transmission of controlled technology, an ITT permit must be submitted to customs at least seven working days before the intended transmission. And for brokers who wish to, brokers, uh, who wish to broker items listed under the Strategic Goods Control Brokering Order, uh, you should register with customs at least 14 working days before commencing with the brokering activities. So this period of time will allow us to take a closer look at your transactions. So in case you are wondering how to proceed to check if goods not listed in the SGCO might be controlled under relevant activity, you should first screen all your customers and known end users of your items against denied or sanctioned party list prior to each sale. For, for such screening, you can rely on third-party software or website that performs screening against sanctioned list, for example, MK Denial, Amber Road, Visual Compliance, or you can search the various government and UNSC website. If your screenings show that they have no WMD links, you can then proceed with the sale. For entities which are traced, take a closer look to see if they are of weapons of mass destruction proliferation risk. When in doubt, inquire more details on the end use of the items from your customers. You should be wary of customers who are evasive and unclear about how the product is going to be used. Chances are they might have something to hide from you. Now, with the information at hand, you assess if the end use or end user are of any concern. Some useful questions to ask are whether the item's capabilities are consistent with the buyer's line of business. So you may find it odd if there are order for CNC lathe machines for a firm dealing with IT service. Next, always inform customs if you know or suspect that your items may be used for relevant activity. This is good practice, even if you decide not to conduct business with the potential customer overseas. And now if you have checked, assessed and are still unsure, you can submit to customs an application to seek preliminary advice on strategic goods transaction before you sign any contracts or apply for a permit for, a permit for relevant activity. So if you know or have reasonable grounds to suspect that goods or technology which you are handling are intended to be used, you should gather the following information, consignee details, information on intermediaries, delivery information, 
Item description and details, including the model or chemical abstract service registration number and technical specifications. And to inform customs of relevant activity shipments, please email the information gathered to customs underscore stgc at customs.gov.sg and explain why you suspect that the shipment may be intended for relevant activity use. Um, because of some time constraint, uh, I think Teresa from VIS has covered some red flags. I think by this stage, it should, it should be a little bit commonsensical to you already. So you can read these slides which we have uploaded. Um, I'll now talk about offences. So these are the offences for failing to adhere to relevant activity controls as described in an earlier slide. An offence is committed when you fail to take up a requisite permit after being notified to do so, did not take up a permit despite having the knowledge that goods will be used for relevant activity, or did not take up a permit despite having grounds to suspect that goods will be used for relevant activity. So under Section 5, Subsection 6 of the Strategic Goods Control Act, any person who fails to take up a strategic goods permit when required to is subjected to a fine of up to 100,000 or three times the value of the goods, whichever is greater, or imprisonment of up to ten, two years, or both for the first conviction. And of course, harsher penalties for, you know, are imposed for second and subsequent convictions. Yep. So I've come to the end of the presentation. I thank you for your attention. Um, if you have further questions, you can look for me at the back. Thank you. Okay, that about wraps us up. Um, a couple of announcements that I'm gonna hand it over, hand the microphone over to Madam Fazia for closing and to send everyone home. Um, speakers, if we can meet in the back of the room um, for a short little photo op before we um, leave. Also, if you have not scanned your QR code, please do it now. Please, please, please fill out your feedback form. And one last time on the uh, parking coupons at the registration table. So again, um, I want to thank all of our speakers and everyone that traveled from outside of Singapore to come today. Thank you so much. It was an amazing opportunity to hear it from everybody. Our folks from Germany, from Japan, from the US, from the Philippines, from Malaysia, from everywhere else that people came from. Thank you. Um, biggest event that we've held for this. It's always fun to try and outdo Don. Um, you know, uh, he, he set a pretty high bar for me when I first got here on these events, working with customs. Um, it's a great opportunity to come out here and, and get this. These are the, com the companies in this room, as Don laid it out, are ones we're probably not so worried about because you're taking the time to do this. Um, again, thank you. And I turn the mic over to Madam Fazia to wrap this up and, and closing statements. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. Um, well, I hope you have important and useful takeaways from today's session. We know that majority of our traders are or strive to be compliant, but there are also those who only focus on increasing sales or revenue without placing much attention on the rules and regulations. Though the number may be small, the inadvertent indirect impact could be greater to the whole supply chain security and, of course, maybe country's economy as well as security impact. The challenges are greater, perhaps for the small and medium enterprises or freight forwarders, for example, to avoid being inadvertently involved in illicit or dubious shipments. So I would like to remind again, be aware, do monitor the developments of international export control, strategic trade controls, including control lists, updates and interpretations, for example, on the foreign policies of the countries concerned as well as their extraterritorial applications. And also for transshipment and transit controls that uh, are implemented by intermediary ports like Singapore. So be mindful, uh, do be aware of what is controlled and what is required for your shipments to pass through these ports. And I hope the presentations by our private sector experts from Yokogawa Electric and Keysight Technologies have also been useful in helping you to set up or improve your company's internal compliance programs. We know compliant traders with good internal compliance programs will be entitled to bulk permit, license facilitations, as against non-compliant ones, 
which could be subject to more checks, closer scrutiny, and delays or prohibition of their licenses or permit applications. So as a general rule, entities must be inquisitive, be wary of any red flags, ask questions or seek advice and exercise your due diligence. And if you make mistakes, do submit voluntary disclosures. At least for Singapore, we do have that. <laughs> okay, so with that, I would like to express again our appreciation to USBIS, XBIS, DOE, and Japan METI, Scott and his team, and Janine and the rest of my customs colleagues for making this seminar possible. Our sincere thanks to our expert speakers for their time and enlightening presentations from the seven, sorry, six countries, excluding Singapore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, before we conclude, please remember to fill up your online feedback form. Uh, your feedback is important to us, especially on how we would want to organize future uh, industry outreach such as this. And I wish all a pleasant evening and for our foreign visitors to have a safe journey home. Thank you.